francophone, lusophone, and uh, arabophone. And uh, membership is open to all people and organizations that are committed to an Africa with strong self-sustaining and robust health systems. So if you are not yet a member, please consider joining this important organization. You can join ours as given, you can see it there. If you put in afrihealth.org, you'll be able to see what we are all about and uh, be able to join us. You are all very welcome. Others will call global health and social transformation. In this acronym is ACHEST, is be able to share them. So our speakers today are Professor Omaswa Francis, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the African Center for Global Health and Social Transformation. Then the second one is uh, Professor Ian Cooper, who is the Director of Uganda Center for Rural Health, Department of Global Health, which is in Stellen at Stellenbosch University, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And then we'll have uh, Dr. Delan Yodovlo, who is the president of African Platform on Human Resources for Health and is based in Ghana. Thank you very much, our speakers, for allowing to share with us our thought, your thoughts, and we are really looking forward to hearing from you. I would like to welcome all of you, members of AfriHealth, members of ACHEST, members of the African Platform of Human Resources for Health, and members of our partners from all over the globe, you are all very welcome to this uh, webinar. And we are going to have one and a half hours of sharing on how to prepare the health workforce to engage with communities. So I would like to invite Professor Omaswa, our first speaker, to talk to us about community engagement. You are welcome, Professor Omaswa. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, our uh, moderator, uh, Professor Elsie Siguri Mawade. And greetings to all of you. Uh, it is a pleasure to see on this screen now uh, colleagues like uh, uh, Della Doblo, who is uh, participating in this. I haven't seen the picture of Ian Cooper yet, but I hope uh, during the afternoon we will. Uh, and uh, th this is a, a topic uh, which uh, we have been inspired uh, to share with you through a webinar uh, by a number of factors. Of course, by far the most significant factor is the current COVID situation in the world and in our various countries. Uh, here uh, in Uganda, we are having a bad sp spike right now. Uh, many people are ill and uh, hospitals uh, almost full, the shortage of oxygen, there is no vaccine. And in the struggle here in Uganda, the arrangements, I was asked to be the chair of the Community Engagement Committee of the National COVID Task Force. And in all this, thinking about what, the, uh, what community engagement is about, uh, what it is, it uh, is very clear that without the participation of communities, interruption of transmission, uh, home-based care, and also following SOPs which are issued by the government just doesn't occur. Without the cooperation of the people, without winning their trust and uh, their support, it is simply not possible. Being together with the communities, we were attached to families and so on as undergraduates. And 
that message sunk home. So after uh, 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 training, my very first appointment, I was uh, posted as a medical officer to a, a rural hospital. Uh, the nearest town was like 60 kilometers away. My boss, who was the district uh, medical officer, was 100 kilometers away. And as you would expect, uh, I quickly found that there were children who, who were uh, coming to the hospital, like with diarrhea. You treat them, they get better, and they go away uh, two weeks again. They have come back again. So I started a community uh, health program at the hospital. And lo and behold, my district medical officer came to hear about it. He drove up 100 kilometers to tell me to stop it. That's not your job. That's my job. Your job is to treat people who come here when they are sick. I was very surprised by that. And um, I, I did the uh, uh, object uh, and I raised an issue with uh, his bosses uh, who came back to me and said, oh, uh, doctor, don't stop. Just carry on with your community health program. So there you are. Uh, uh, um, without um, uh, awareness of communities, it's really not possible for us to talk about de de delivering any health systems uh, worth their name. I'm, I'm going, I debated whether to show slides or not, but in the end, uh, I'm going to show you a few slides and um, share screen. Where is that going to be? share screen yes. at, at the bottom of the screen that green box have you seen it prof yes i've clicked it and now okay there Uh, 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 okay, you, you can see the slide now? Yes, please. Okay, Just put it on your slideshow, please. Slideshow. Uh, yes, don't we can. Worry. You, you go ahead. So. Yeah, I will, just, I will just move them. But the first slide is straightforward. What is health? Health is beyond uh, illness. It is well-being. This is a WHO Constitution, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They all emphasize that health is beyond illness. And it is also about the quality of life, whether you are food, clothes, housing, and whether you are happy. And then we move on from there to this very important message. This is the foundation of uh, community engagement. At birth, most of us are born healthy. Mm -hmm. And the body is physiologically regulated to ensure a, an, a, what a, a Claude Bernard in physiology called milieu interior, so that the internal system is very well regulated by the body's rest, uh, uh, balance mechanism, feedback mechanisms. If you are hungry, uh, you are short of glucose, you feel hungry, you eat. If you have uh, eaten enough, it will tell you to stop. If you are short of water, you feel thirsty, etc., etc., etc. And the body has got its mechanisms to defend against infections and foreign bodies and so on. And therefore, the responsibility of us as humans and people is to support this body's indigenous mechanism by obeying it. And that transfers then the responsibility to the individual, to the household, to the family. And the message that health is made in the homes of the people is one which I used to advocate very vigorously when I was director general here in the government of Uganda. Health is made in the homes of people and it is maintained by that interior and we, 
our job is just to make sure that we don't disrupt it. Uh, so uh, 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 communities where they live, where they work, that's where the battle for health is fought. Uh, and then also uh, uh, ownership for health outcomes. It has to be owned, it must come from inside people. We must be convinced about it and we must own it. And if we don't, and if we don't get our communities to, to, to be uh, owners of their health, then we are going to struggle in whatever else we are going to put into our health systems. And also people value their health. This is a study here in Uganda uh, uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, 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 what are the main causes of your, uh, your poverty? The people would say it is poor health. And what happens to you when you are poor? I will get sick and I will die. So people value their health. And it is our job, therefore, as uh, um, uh, trainers and leaders to make sure that we support people to value their health and to own it. And this, therefore, calls for a partnership between individuals and uh, their health systems and their governments. Uh, because even when individuals, uh, are behaving well. There are things they can't do for themselves, maybe like access to uh, clean water, access to housing, to knowledge, to law and order, being able. So there is a partnership then between the individuals, their health systems, and their governments. Uh, and again, uh, uh, Alma Atta Health for All, it again tells us that people have the right and they also have a duty to participate individually and collectively in the planning and implementation of their uh, health. So the role of people is fundamental and very well entrenched. And we need to be aware of this next message, the tension between medical care and health promotion, the tension between attending to those who are sick and empowering people to uh, uh, and communities uh, to continue to live well. And you will find that even now with SDGs, um, there are so many indicators about diseases, but there is not a single indicator on people participation to achieve universal health coverage. And this is a big gap. So the pressure to treat convulsing children, obstructed labor, it captures the attention of the health system and even the population. But the equally important effort to keep healthy people healthy and to work with communities to make sure that they remain healthy is overlooked. So that then takes us, as I conclude, so where does this uh, 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 lead us in Afri Health as uh, educators and researchers? And it takes me back again to my days as a student, an uh, undergraduate student at Makerere Medical School, where preventive medicine was given top priority and a lot of time. And it helped me when I started to work as a, a brand new doctor uh, in, in a, a lonely country place to practice community medicine. So I would like us today to rededicate ourselves to the importance of partnership with communities and bringing up our new graduates in such a way that they understand and respect the role of communities in one, looking after themselves, creating health in their own homes, and two, in, in setting up their practices so that it is just not about treating diseases, but it is also about making sure that inborn health is, is maintained and kept. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for those words and uh, highlighting uh, what is, how important it is for us to really communicate with the communities. I, I believe that 
as uh, trainers, unless we contextualize what we teach our students, it does not really make much sense for them. They need to know where they come from, where their patients come from. They need to know how they live so that they can influence their wellness. As Prof says, it's not only about illness, it's about the wellness of our communities. So thank you very much, Professor. And uh, for those that have comments and questions, please put them in the chat box. We'll be able to come back to them later. And next, I would like to invite Professor Ian Cooper from uh, Stellenbosch University, who is the director of Wakanda Rural Clinical School, to give us some insights of how they are doing this at Stellenbosch. I've been uh, privileged to visit their rural school and see how things are done. And uh, I've really been impressed on how they make sure that uh, their students actually work with the communities and understand their communities so that they can serve them better. So thank you very much, Professor Cooper, for agreeing to share with us your experiences in your school. Over to you. Thank you very much, Elsie, and good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. And thank you very much, uh, yeah, both Elsie to you and uh, Professor Maswa for your uh, comments, which lead in so well to what I'm going to talk about. Uh, how do we teach people about the context that um, Professor Elsie was talking about? And how do we prepare people so that they come out like uh, Francis Omaswa in terms of their understanding, the holistic con uh, understanding. He links that back to his own experience at Makarere and how do we give students that kind of experience and train different people. So that's really the background to uh, the Rural Clinical School at Stellenbosch University. Our faculty works across two campuses, uh, the one on the, on the left, Tiger campus with the big central academic hospital next to it, and then Worcester campus, which I'm going to talk some more about. But just by way of background, the Ukwanda Center for Health, Ukwanda is a word meaning to grow. We are growing our human resources. It was established in 2001 as part of a faculty strategy to develop community-based education. And we wanted to train people who were able to serve rural and underserved communities. It was the first center for rural health in Africa and has been followed by two more in South Africa. And I know University of Kadabar in Nigeria is, is in the process or was in the process of setting one up, but it's well known internationally as a model. And I showed you the Worcester campus. We've been based there since, since 2012. And just as an aside, if you're talking about human resources and community engagement, I really recommend the uh, book that came out from the EMRO region of WHO on community-based education in health professions that you see referred to at the bottom of the slide. So uh, for those who don't know South African geography, Cape Town is there. Uh, Stellenbosch University, that, it's, it's, it's there, but in fact, the medical school is in Cape Town itself because Stellenbosch is a fairly small place. And then Worcester is about 120 kilometers outside um, of Cape Town. Okwanda's mission, I won't go into all the details, but part of it is around transformative and tech contextualized training for students at all levels in order to respond to the needs of rural populations. Um, we follow our idea of a pipeline that it's not just about training undergraduate students. We've got to look at who we uh, recruit into the health professions from high school how we develop postgraduate students and faculty, how we support rural health workers. All of that is part of improving uh, rural health care. The Rural Clinical School was established in 2011 under the Aquanda Center for Rural Health. And it was really about getting students, undergraduate students to understand rural communities, rural lifestyle, rural health care, so that we would uh, increase the number and the skills of graduates uh, choosing to practice in that context. And it was both about training and giving hope to rural communities. It was part of a bigger university project called Project Hope, um, because that was, was critical. 
It was the first rural clinical school in South Africa, but it's a, the, the model was developed in Australia, where it's actually a federally funded project, and almost every medical school in, in Australia uh, has a rural clinical school because they can get funding if they actually establish one and they meet certain criteria in the way that they uh, run those, which we can go into if anyone is interested. So our sites, uh, I showed you Worcester area, we work in, in Worcester itself, which is a regional center, about 100,000 people, an agricultural center. But then there's a whole lot of small towns, Ceres, Robertson, Swelland, and Hermanus that are around the, the Cape Winelands and Overberg districts of the Western Cape, in which we are also working and have students. Our long-term plan is to have more than one rural clinical school. Um, so that is not the Stellenbosch University Rural Clinical School, it's, it's a rural clinical school and at the moment we're working in, in Uppington, which is 850 kilometers away from, from Cape Town and uh, are, are looking to, to develop, to have started developing training there since 2019. And we're learning lessons along the way and have learned lessons from our previous experience. One of the lessons from the previous experience is that we started with medicine and then added the other programs. Going to Uppington, we've started with all the health professions together. We haven't said, you know, one must start, others must follow. So that we took an interprofessional team right from the beginning when we went to visit um, the regional hospital in, in Uppington. There are three motivations behind it. Firstly, there's a social imperative, social accountability, which is about ensuring equity and access to care and making sure that we are providing the human resource needs so that there is equity and access to care. The second one is an educational imperative, the call by the Lancet Commission in 2010 to transform health professions education. And our experience is that the way we are training students in this is transformative. There, it's not just about education in terms of narrowly con, uh, confined to academic learning, but it's around transforming their understanding of themselves and of the world. And thirdly, there's a service imperative. We've shown uh, the research that students, senior students, which uh, what we train in the rural clinical school, make a difference and have an impact on healthcare and improve the quality of healthcare through their involvement. So all five of the current health professional undergraduate programs at Stellenbosch University are involved in the rural clinical school. Nursing was only recently reintroduced at Sermach University. There's a whole history which I'm not going to go into now, but we look forward to them being involved as well. And interprofessional learning is a key element of our programs in the rural clinical school. What we do is we adapt the model to suit programs. So for some programs, there are short rotations, for example, speech, language, and hearing therapy. They have seven week rotations. Uh, but all these students then have to come to the rural clinical school for those rotations. In others, they're long rotations, 10 weeks, 12 weeks. Uh, and in the case of three programs, we have students for an entire year, which I will, will come back to. There's also the issue of should it be voluntary or compulsory? Human nutrition, for example, has everybody has to do a short rotation in the rural clinical school, but people can choose to do a longer one if they want. Um, when people are, are having to come for a longer period, we find that voluntary is better than compulsory um, for that. It's very much about service learning. Students are engaged in service and they're engaged in and with communities. And we place a lot of emphasis on the context of the communities, the context of patients, the holistic understanding that Professor Maswa was talking about, um, which is critical in terms of working in that context and understanding the context. And as I've alluded to, we have a major focus on collaborative care. So we have interprofessional patient discussions and team-based contextual visits where a student from any professional background can bring a patient. It's discussed by uh, all the students across program and together they decide what are the issues that need to be addressed and looked at when they do uh, what we call a contextual visit, classically known as a home visit. And then that is reported back to the group and, and they work together in terms of discussing it. We also feel that without those home visits, one cannot really understand the patient. And so to the extent we've actually developed virtual home visits where only one or two people go to the home and the others are, are virtually present with them through uh, um, video and, and audio contact. Uh, do, we've been doing that during the COVID uh, situation. 
We have a service learning center in an informal settlement um, that is on, on the edges of, of the Worcester community uh, where students go um, and work and follow up patients and provide services and do a, a large number of projects as well of different kinds across the different uh, professions. So I mentioned we have some extended programs. So in our medical program, we have a rotational model where 18 students can do their whole final year in the regional hospital doing rotations like they would in the, the central teaching hospital, but they're three students on a unit uh, with three specialists in, the, in, in, in most of, of the units. So they have very close contact and involvement and actually become part of the team. They also have longitudinal primary care involvement in that. More um, radical is that we have a longitudinal integrated model where students can undertake the whole final year in district hospitals. Um, in those small towns that I showed you earlier. So this year we have nine students in those and other six students in Uppington also doing that kind of thing. And this is very much a relationship based approach relationship with the doctors they work with, with the team they work with, with the patients they see, uh, and with the community. And we say that for this, the curriculum is the patients they encounter the patients that walk through the door. So instead of doing six weeks of surgery and then seven weeks of internal medicine, et cetera. They're doing surgery, medicine, obstetrics every day because of the patients they encounter, often who have multiple different issues and they see the patients holistically. They have to achieve the same outcome objectives over the year, which requires us a, a quite a lot of self-regulated learning to make sure they're keeping up with and dealing with and responding to those objectives. Um, and they potentially have the same assessments as the Tiger Big students. There is a system of exam exemption across the faculty, uh, which they are part of as well. But if they don't get exempted, they have to do exactly the same exams as the Tiger Big students. And we've had many students over the years who've actually graduated cum laude in spite of being part of this model. So the performance of students is as good as any of the students who stay in Tiger Big. The students become part of the local team and part of the community while they are there. Just as an aside to say that if you're interested in exploring the whole thing of longitudinal and integrated uh, rotations, clerkships, ways of training, we are hosting a conference in October, an international conference of the Consortium of Longitudinal Integrated Clerkships. Uh, and uh, please uh, come and join us and learn more. That will be an international discussion around these issues. Other programs, occupational therapy, they introduced the first longitudinal programs we know of in the world in terms of uh, students from OT spending a whole year in Worcester undertaking all the four final year rotations there. And they are starting to look at how they can move that towards integration as well. In our new site in Upp Uppington, students can do half of their final year, 20 weeks at a time in Uppington doing their rotations, completely different experience to what they have in the big city. Dietetics, uh, we have four students who spend the whole year. And one of the rotations in that year is the Gwanda rotation, which as I mentioned, all the students have to do, but the others do uh, another three on top of that when they are with us. Physiotherapy, exciting, is pioneering, pioneering a unique 10 week integrated uh, physiotherapy rotation, excuse the typo, in, in Uppington and Worcester, with an emphasis on community engagement and are looking at uh, extending that uh, further. We're doing this in partnership with government, the health services, with NGO partners, schools. The, there's an Institute for the Blind, Institute for the Deaf, uh, uh, the Association for People with Disabilities, et cetera, and various community-based organizations. And it's very much about mutual benefit and, and reflection on that. Um, and how can uh, students support the partners? As part of that, we have annual community partnership functions in, in each of the major subdistricts we work in, where students together with their partners report on their experiences. We actually say students, if they're going to present, they must have the partners involved and they present together. And we've been doing that for a number of years. And we also have representatives on, on our board. If you want to know more, there's a chapter in the South African Health Review from 2017 uh, in in terms of some of the lessons learned, um, obviously we've been learning more lessons and have developed further since then. Now that was, was 2017. Uh, but if you just go to South African Health Review uh, and, and look for that, you will find it. But you're welcome to contact me um, if you, if you uh, want more information. 
Uh, do come and visit us, as Elsie said. Uh, we, we're very happy to, to have you and to share more of our experiences. Thank you, and, and back to you, uh, Elsie. Thank you very much, Ian, for sharing with us that the work that you are doing. Uh, during the Medicare Education Partnership Initiative days, I was privileged to travel around uh, Africa and uh, see similar uh, um, things being done in many parts of, uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa. And so, although we chose Ian to talk about what they are doing in, at Stellenbosch, there are many other examples in the region that are doing these beautiful things. And we need to document them so that we can uh, share. So we'll get back to you, Ian, if there are questions and comments later. So we'll go on to our next speaker soon. And I, I know that this approach of com community-based education and service and uh, research is happening in, uh, like at Makere University, where I taught for a very long time, and Professor Sawan Campbell is on this, uh, on this webinar. He led the changing of curriculum that involved more community-based education and service, which from what uh, Professor Maswa says had been there. So it is, it's uh, been called different things at different times, but it's really important for us to emphasize it, to make sure that it continues and that uh, the right emphasis is put on our students being pre properly prepared to work with the communities. So I have the pleasure of inviting uh, Dr. Dovlo, who is the president of the African Platform on Human Resources for Health, to share with us uh, about linking the health education to, to health systems. You are welcome, Dr. Dovlo. Thank you very much, Elsie. Uh, um, what I would like to do is to uh, uh, provide some uh, uh, insights from my experience working on human resources for health, but also on health systems over the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes and link to uh, some of the issues raised in the fascinating presentations that we've had so far. And I would also like to start uh, with a couple of personal examples as to how training uh, used to be and hopefully is still the situation in many medical schools in, in Africa, I hope. Um, I had three points in a six year medical education that took me first to uh, what's called a, a social pediatric situation that brought us into the homes in poor areas of the city Accra where we did our training to understand where our patients were coming from, especially when we did the pediatric rotations. In addition, we are also expected to spend time in a very rural uh, uh, health center uh, and live there with the same conditions and uh, understand how people access health care and what the limitations and approaches are for providing those care for them and what it meant when they came to see us in the hospitals. Um, the, that experience is more of an immersion as far away as possible in the, in a rural hospital with hands-on clinical skill and training and also again with a lot of uh, links to the community and the peripheral network of uh, health facilities that were available and so it was uh, important to come out with an understanding of what your country looked like for a lot of the people that you saw and what it meant uh, to be a clinician. For a lot of us, sometimes we were not too pleased because some, uh, many of us came from rural areas already. We thought we're familiar with what the situations were, but it's still a lot of uh, great training. I think for the health system, uh, 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 there are quite a number of issues that need to interface with education of health workers in order to reflect what the, the needs of a community are. As uh, Professor Maso has said, um, community health implies that communities should be largely responsible for their own health. 
And that is up to us as professionals and leaders of the health systems to facilitate uh, their awareness and knowledge of health and make sure that we channel the resources in a way that facilitates these efforts and makes it cost efficient and sustainable. Uh, Mercy, often we, we fail at this in, in many uh, uh, situations. Again, what can one say are the needs that we need to think through as we develop health workers to serve in communities and to be more responsive to the communities that they serve? There are a number of issues that come up. Uh, one is in terms of the training system itself and how, like we talked about the pre-service training before you qualify, what amount of engagement do you have there? Uh, the second is, is whilst you are already in practice, what level of your continuing education and your in-service training helps you to uh, evolve to respond to the changing situations in our communities. And indeed, our communities do not remain the same at all. There's increasing urbanization. There are a variety of issues around poverty, around uh, environmental damage, and so on. And communities are evolving all the time. They're becoming more aware or sometimes less aware of the changes around them, uh, which as health workers, we need also to be aware of. And then there's a whole set of uh, other issues coming up uh, because of the health security challenges that we face, um, particularly uh, uh, exemplified by the COVID pandemic. Uh, how do we equip and protect the workforce and train them to be able to interact and interface with communities in the way that one protects themselves, but also protects the communities and the people who come out of the communities to assess uh, our services. And this also means understanding, as has been said earlier, around issues of the team that works there, the scope of practice, how to delegate uh, tasks and roles that are played in a way that ensures that uh, people in the communities uh, do not get uh, 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 shunted away from an equitable access uh, to, to health services. I think the other thing I would like to mention is that whilst as a, a close group of health systems people, we are discussing things like this, often the way that organizational and political culture also affects how well our systems function for communities. Um, and it creates a certain work environment that might impact on the morale or effectiveness of, of, of the workforce. And so I would like to argue that it's not only about the training, but also a certain set of organizational environmental values that uh, uh, encourage the health worker to perform as effectively as they can in the situation that they find themselves engaging more closely with communities. The other aspect that has often come up is uh, in a way a skewed relationship between the health system and communities. Part of it occasioned by the fact that whilst we invest a lot in the training of our health workers and the people who come in contact with them, uh, there's little such investment in, uh, on, in the other side that is, uh, uh, for a lot of places, they'll have community health committees, they'll have focal points, there'll be community health workers, there'll be community communicators who interface with the health system. And often, um, uh, the bulk of the training is on the technical side of, of health workers, whilst the capacity of the community to be able to engage more effectively with the health worker is also somewhat neglected. And that for me is one of the areas that we need to, to look at uh, in order to make this interaction between the health workforce and the communities more effective and uh, with a better understanding from both sides of the aisle. Uh, is the training and the capacity is overwhelmingly in favor of the health worker, uh, 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 whether community based or otherwise, then that becomes a challenge. 
And then in line with what I mentioned earlier about creating the environment, I think one of the biggest challenges we have with educating the workforce uh, to engage communities better is the fact that whilst we make quite an effort at um, uh, the people who provide the clinical services, the uh, public health and community health nurses and other type uh, workforce that uh, may be in direct connection with the communities, often the way policy is implemented, developed and implemented is in the hands of the leadership, the management, the supervisors. I think uh, uh, Dr. Masua talked about his district medical officer who was uh, displeased that he was trying to engage with the communities, which was his job. And sometimes that sort of uh, interaction uh, might be negative in taking our, our situation forward. And so one of the areas that I feel is very important in training for communities is getting the leadership and the management to be more engaged to understand their roles and to provide also a certain level of mentorship, coaching and support that health workers at the community level require. Now, this again requires a certain level of skills and capacity to be able to carry this out effectively. And often uh, the system is found missing in developing these skills and, and getting them out there. Like it or not, in, in a number of areas, the people who tend to become the leaders of the health systems come from the elite sometimes. And so um, uh, they might not be in a position where they understand these things effectively. And that's why I like an experience I had, I think it was in Malawi, where when you enter medical school, the first three months or so are spent actually living in a rural community in the same house that everybody lives in, that sort of uh, situation. And so uh, it's only after that first rotation that you come out for the usual formal lectures and engagement on different aspects of medical uh, training. And that provides a certain mindset, I believe, that can then carry on as you become a leader of the teams that are present. There was a point Professor Cooper mentioned about um, the training of the team as a whole together. And I think that's crucially important, not only for the community level, but other levels as well. Uh, uh, my situation uh, in, in Ghana now is you find a lot of tension between various professions uh, because uh, the overlapping scopes of practice sometimes and, uh, and uh, issues of leadership and interaction around the same workplace. And that often militates against being efficient and effective. And so I thought that was a very important point around how do we immerse people in communities in a way that is not along the individual professions, but it's bringing the different players at that level together to understand the different roles they play and how they complement each other. And so these are quite a number of things that don't readily happen in a, in a, in a classroom and together bring about a certain environment for good performance. Finally, uh, I hope uh, there were a couple of things that I would like to raise. For a lot of us as professionals, um, our accreditation, our licensure uh, depends on uh, meeting certain requirements and so on. And often um, some of the issues we are talking about do not come up as, as uh, uh, a way of um, uh, moving the agenda uh, forward. Uh, should your community engagement, community attachment, uh, interaction with other team members be part of uh, the CPD points you need to gain in order to get your annual or otherwise reaccreditation uh, uh, to practice in different situations? Because we need to create a certain incentive around being well-groomed in community engagement and the needs of the community. And again, as I said, the communities are constantly evolving and we need to continue to 
develop ourselves in understanding how these changes are taking place so that we can become effective uh, uh, performers. And so finally, to say that um, in order for all this to work, we need to look at how we invest in the training, but also in motivating and retaining the health workers in that area. And then so encouraging them uh, to engage and work with communities in the way that we envisage. And that has been described by both um, Professor Maso and Professor Cooper. I think with that, I'll uh, finish my, uh, the points I wanted to raise and uh, we can have a discussion during the uh, question and answer. Thank you. On some bench, the government is so it's good to thank all us, and uh, it's now for discussion. You you have some questions in the chat box. And if you like something, you will feel free to raise your hand. Ah, uh, looks like uh, Elsie has dropped off. Our connection was getting weaker and weaker. Um, but I think she was uh, uh, encouraging us now to get involved in the discussion. And um, uh, you can put your hand up through the uh, system here, and we will invite you to speak. Uh, okay, uh, she's back again. Uh, are you there, Elsie? We can see you. Can you hear us? You are muted. Sorry, Mike. Yes. No, I'm unmuted now. Sorry. I dropped off. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, so I was saying that a question goes to Ian, saying that the Western Cape is mainly an urban area, and so somebody is asking, what are those? What about the rural, the actual rural communities? Which are the rural communities that you are targeting? That the most of the pictures you showed showed urban uh, settings. Over to you. Thanks, Elsie, and thanks for the question, Prudence. We could spend an afternoon discussing the definition of rural. Uh, rural is not about underdeveloped or developed. Uh, the definitions across the world are, are different, but it's really around uh, level of population density. It's around distance from, from facilities, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, the Western Cape generally is more developed than many other parts of the country that I worked in. Um, I worked in the Northwest province for 16 years and in the uh, KwaZulu-Natal for, for 10 years. So I'm very familiar with more uh, underdeveloped rural areas as well. But what we found in common across the world is that there are certain things that are the same, regardless of the degree of development, when you come to rural areas and in terms of accessing care. And those are the kind of principles that, that we uh, can focus on. At the same time, I can tell you that uh, in places like Sierra, Swellendam, and certainly in, in the Northern Cape, in, in Uppington, uh, and areas where we work in there, um, the, the, what you encounter there is very much the same things I've encountered in the Northwest and KwaZulu Natal. So I don't think it's it's actually so um, hugely different. Uh, the Northern Cape, the Western half of the Northern Cape uh, has a fraction of the number of health workers compared to anywhere else because the figures in the Northern Cape look good because everyone is around Kimberley, the capital of the province, which is in the Eastern side. Anyway, I, I could spend much more time on that issue, but I think that's enough just for me to say that. Okay, Th thank you very much. And I've actually been to areas that are very rural in the Western Cape, not very different from most of the areas like 
deep down in the rural areas of, uh, of, uh, of Uganda. Another question to you before we go on is uh, somebody's asking about assessment. How do you assess the medical students that have the longitudinal integrated uh, clerkship model? I know you talked about, but you talked about it, but you could just elaborate a little on that. Sure. So um, we use uh, workplace based assessment very much. So they are assessed um, using. Uh, many CXs, in other words, observed consultations while they're with patients, and also DOPS, which is direct observation of procedural skills. But they also are assessed more formally twice a year using portfolios where they have to come with a portfolio of patients, uh, patient studies, and, and divide it up across the different disciplines. And then they get um, examined on, on those. They can be asked questions on any of the, the patients that they have. And there's a certain number they have to have for each discipline. And, and, and they have that. But again, very much based on what they're doing. If they don't achieve well enough for that, then they go to, to Tigerberg and do the same exam that the other students do who are not exempted from, from uh, end of year exams. Um, the uh, ones at Worcester do more rotation-based assessments, but, but, but similar principles. Okay, thank you. And uh, to Professor Maswa or, or Dr. Dovlo, how do we um, reach out to the ministries of health in different uh, countries? How do we involve them in uh, linking the health system to the education system? And uh, how do we involve the communities in all this work? Okay, I could take a stab at first uh, in responding to that, and Professor Boswa could come in later. I think, um, in my view, uh, some ministries do well in this area of uh, constructed community health systems programs that are quite comprehensive, that look at what's happening in their communities and, and try to respond and innovate uh, and to serve communities. Uh, two examples um, uh, that one might want to look at would be say, for example, the, the Rwandan system, combining community-based health insurance, uh, uh, the outreach of infrastructure, with uh, a quite strong network of community health uh, workers uh, to build a system. A second example is probably Ethiopia, uh, also with similar network of different cadets and systems uh, to engage with. Now, on the other hand, there are also ministries that seem a bit um, divorced uh, from the reality of what happens in community and more or less leave that to uh, uh academicians or other uh, even ngos and so on to take up the responsibility which is not ideal i think what uh, we should be doing is to have uh, uh, metrics uh, data that is able to show how the differences are much more clearly between urban and rural areas Often we are divided into districts or, uh, the, uh, or regions, and the average sort of data that comes out hides a lot of uh, crippling disparities uh, in different types of population and vulnerable groups. And I think one of the main things we need to do is to be able to disaggregate some of the data along those lines to be able to demonstrate to ministries uh, more clearly where the differences are over. Uh, Thank you. Professor Omaswa, yes. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Very good question. You know, many medical schools, uh, including, of course, uh, I told you about my upbringing, but I know that uh, uh, in the later years, uh, with you talked about Nelson, Sewan Kambo, and so on, Makerere has still got um, a vigorous program encouraging students to uh, learn how to work uh, uh, with communities. But the challenge comes indeed with the ministries to create favorable working conditions for those uh, practitioners who 
would like to remain working in communities. Very often, the uh, people who uh, go to work in uh, rural areas are the ones who have failed to get jobs in urban areas. Uh, also, the conditions of work when you are out there, uh, there's no schools for your children to go to, and you are not compensated for some of the challenges you experience while uh, uh, living in uh, uh, small communities as opposed to those who live in urban areas. One of the best examples I, I learned in my work uh, when I was at the Global Workforce Alliance is the experience of Thailand. Thailand have a strong association of rural doctors and a rural doctor's salary is higher than that of the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health in the headquarters. So they have a deliberate program to attract doctors to work in rural areas. They have associations, they have meetings when they are able to talk to each other and so on. So uh, the, the real challenge we face here, uh, they, there are so many guidelines which have been issued on how to uh, promote rural retention. Uh, but uh, there are very, very few countries who have been able to put this into practice. So maybe our effort as part of this discussion that we are having now is to uh, do a, a more thorough examination here in Africa as to how we can encourage governments to promote uh, and support uh, rural retention, not just of doctors, but of also nurses, lab people, pharmacists, and so on. Because up to now in many communities, uh, the people actually are out there in rural areas, spend a lot of money traveling to towns to look for help, which they could easily get near their homes. Thank you. Maybe, uh, you, maybe Ian, you have an experience also of uh, how to, uh, what happens to your graduates. Ian, would you like to say something about that? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, we, it is one of the ongoing bits of work we're doing is to track our graduates and see what's, what's happening to them because that's ultimate proof. And I mean, the initial results are good. Um, obviously, we need to see what is, what is happening longer term. But it seems that, uh, you know, that uh, significant numbers of them are going to rural areas, are uh, staying in the public service, etc. The current research we, we're busy on is actually to do a comparison between a cohort through the rural clinical school and a cohort in the, uh, that didn't go to the rural clinical school and see, uh, see the differences. Uh, and I would support what you said in terms of Thailand. I think what Thailand has done is uh, is, is significant. Um, but I think Ethiopia is also in terms of, of deciding that every every hospital would be a draining institution. And I mean, I think that's the kind of radical, uh, I mean, you can criticize them for many aspects of that, but that's the kind of radical decisions that, that one needs to make if one wants to make a true difference is, is to is to change those arrangements. I think Iran is another place that's interesting in terms of the way they've gone about things where um, they actually have a ministry of medical education that actually brings education and health together uh, to make, and, and the heads of health districts are actually public health specialists who are appointed in the university as well as in the, um, through this ministry of, of medical education. So they, they're both making decisions on policy, but also examining the data and bringing that to bear on, on, on policy decisions. And I, I think that's a very interesting model as well. Thank you. I think the dichotomy between uh, the Ministry of Education and Ministry of, uh, of Health is real, in that most times the, the schools are under the Ministry of Education and then the hospitals uh, and uh, communities and health is being looked after by the Ministry of Health. And many times they don't even speak to each other and that uh, causes uh, issues. Somebody is commenting about the internet and social media and whether this is having an influence on the way we are training in the communities and or if it's making things better for the rural 
areas and communities. I don't know if Ian, if you, you would like to comment on how the internet is changing the way we are training in the rural areas. Well, certainly it's, I mean, it, it, it makes it easier in many ways. I mean, and, and, and uh, what's been particularly fascinating for us is with, uh, with the COVID experience where we used to try and get our colleagues in Tigerberg to support, especially um, in, in the Uppington as we've gone there and we reached out there and to support them. And, and, you know, they weren't, they said they weren't able to, but suddenly now because of COVID, everybody's supporting students online. Suddenly they can support our students as well because they've got used to doing that. So, I mean, I think that's an example of how it can be, can be used. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, the issue always is with, with, with telemedicine or that kind of support, you need people on both sides. You need the people who are willing to give their time to support the, the, the rural folk and you need the, 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 the rural folk who've got the time to actually sit and, and engage. And I think the social, the, the, the informal relationships that, uh, that, that Mike English is referring to in the question are critical and they've always been important, I think, in, in, in rural uh, practice is those informal networks that, that are created. People get to know who are the best resource people, who they can go to, how they can get help. And it just makes it easier through social media than it, it used to be before. Just maybe one last thing to say we're an interesting negative side effect of of the media and COVID-19 where rural colleagues shared with me that they've actually had so much more stress than they had before because suddenly there are all of these webinars all of this training that's online and they just don't have time to do it but they're constantly bombarded with this request to to join training programs and this to this and participate in that and and they actually feel stressed by the fact that they can't engage all of that just because they're working so hard. So that's an interesting side effect. I have a couple of comments on that uh, moderator, if you wish. Um, it's, it's been interesting that uh, uh, some of the positives that have come out of uh, the COVID pandemic, it's around increased use of the internet and other such facilities. and. Uh, uh, I recently was in Rwanda and one of the things that came up was uh, increased access to, to uh, medical consultation done via mobile phone or other means in, in quite rural areas as well, reducing the risk of people coming into, into, into facilities uh, uh, and also, uh, of course, uh, uh, the difficulties they face because our people are more used to having uh, somebody to interact with physically than having a virtual con consultation and a virtual prescription. But it was interesting that it increased access to some extent on how uh, a specialist could have a conversation in a rural area and people getting more used to that sort of uh, interaction. And of course, might have opportunities for training, uh, especially for those staff who are already on the ground while this interface is taking place. The second personal experience for me has been uh, the, my faculty at the Ghana College of Physicians in Public Health. Um, used to have to bring all our residents in from wherever they are uh, to come and spend a couple of weeks in Accra, get used to the traffic and all the pollution. And now you could sit in your center and not spend a couple of days having to come out here and we would have these interactions and so on. I think it increases a certain level of efficiency in our interaction with, uh, with people. We keep them on site. We don't disrupt the service they are providing to um, the community out there uh, while they are uh, doing their residences. And I think uh, I thought that was a very positive outcome to our ability to expand and use these uh, uh, services. Over. Thank you, Ian. Uh, yeah. is asking if there's a regional initiative to advocate for yeah as, as far as i know uh, uh i'm not aware of a uh, regional initiative but the movement is growing the movement on um, uh, the whole topic 
of uh, uh, community health is growing. And WHO recently uh, launched some guidelines on, on uh, gave it some name, uh, but it is about this. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Africa has got a health strategy, uh, I think 20, uh, is it 2030. It, uh, there is a, a section there which emphasizes uh, community health. Uh, what is now left is um, for those who are in support of this uh, movement to get together uh, and to, uh, to have uh, a, a, a discussion group and maybe it could become an outcome of this particular webinar that we get together maybe through uh, uh, health, uh, a, a, a group who are promoting um, uh, community health. It is a practice, it is education and training, and uh, particularly uh, getting us to go in the direction of uh, uh, Thailand. I, uh, uh, Ian, I, I visited Iran as well, and it is true their Ministry of Health is uh, called Minister of Health and Medical Education. And maybe that would help. Uh, here in Uganda, education is all under uh, Ministry of, uh, uh, of, of Education, I mean, Health Professionals Education. And it is now running out of control. They run courses which the public system doesn't uh, uh, need. And there are all types of graduates who are really uh, misfits. Uh, so uh, um, let's think about this. Thank you. And through the uh, AfriHealth, we have a technical working group on community-based education and research. And uh, this is uh, a group that actually is interest, interested in uh, community engagement. And that could be used as a point of uh, convening people that are interested because in the, in the region and we move this forward. And uh, Ian has been good enough to, to send the link to the WHO guideline on health workforce development, attraction, recruitment and relationship a retention in rural and remote areas, which was launched by WHO. So if we'd like to know more about that, it's there in the chat box. Uh, we still have some time. Um, someone is asking what might postgraduate clinical rotations in virtual settings look like and what specialities could do this effectively to support the health of rural communities in need. Would somebody like to answer that? Again, Elsie, uh, just repeat it for me. It's what might postgraduate clinical rotations in virtual setting, in a virtual setting look like, and what specialties could do this effectively to support the health of rural communities in need? Mm -hmm. no, I, I know I that not... I know that there are some uh, clinical rotations for postgraduates that actually take place in rural settings. For example, at the University of Jos, obstetrics and gynecology, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology runs postgraduate clinical rotations. And uh, they've done a lot of work in that area. I think it has, also, it has been published. So some of the postgraduate clinical rotations can actually take place in uh, rural settings. And that would also encourage probably or improve the training for postgraduates and their engagement in uh, communities. I'll Ian, Ian has something to say about that. Please go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two, two different things there. I mean, the one is, is virtual training, and the other one is, is rotations. And I'm, I, they, I'm, they both, I'm not clear what exactly the question is asking about, but, but certainly the number of places, and I think it's actually in the WHO document, is recommending that postgraduate 
training for, for clinical specialists include rotations in rural areas as part of their training so that they understand a whole lot of context. But in terms of virtual um, training, certainly in, in the in the consult, it's difficult in the procedural disciplines, surgery and, and obstetrics and things like that. But in the consulting disciplines, uh, medicine, uh, psychiatry, uh, etc., it becomes possible. And and uh, I was involved in helping to set up training for a um, a doctor in a very rural, remote area in the northwest who wanted to go under mental health training. And uh, he met weekly with a this was a postgraduate diploma it wasn't full specialization but he met weekly with a psychiatrist in johannesburg uh online and presented uh, patients you know together online with the with, with the psychiatrist so those sort of things um are possible um and 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 are certainly being explored The concept of virtual rotations uh, is new to me. Uh, how does that work? Well, I think it's come from the idea of what they've certainly in many medical schools I've been having to do that with undergraduate students who cannot be in the clinical site for, for training. Um, but I mean, there's a limit to what you can do in a virtual rotation. That's that's clear. Mm -hmm. And I was actually in a in a symposium yesterday. We we're busy with our um, SAI, the South African Association of Health Educationers. We had a uh, a uh, symposium yesterday on longitudinal training. We had Professor mm -hmm. Paul Worley from Australia joining that, and he said one of the advantages of the longitudinal training that I was talking about is that if somebody, if students have to be taken out of the environment because of COVID for four weeks, six weeks, um, eight weeks, you can amortize that over the whole program because, uh, because they're doing everything in an integrated fashion. Whereas if you have to take someone out for four, six, eight weeks and they miss the whole of the surgical rotation or the whole of the pediatric rotation, uh, you know, how do you deal with that? They actually need to come back at the end and, and still have that rotation because they, they they haven't got the skills they need. So yeah, that is an issue. Someone is talking about privatization of health professional education and how this has made it difficult for students to take part in community placements because they have to pay for them. And that this is happening in Kenya where they have to, the students have to pay for their transportation and accommodation in the areas when they have to go for clinical rotations outside their schools. Any comments on that? Okay, let me perhaps kick off uh, with uh, maybe a couple of views on that. Uh, indeed, I think in many countries, uh, private uh, participation in the training of health workers has become quite important and it's expanding. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is uh, one, having adequate numbers of, of uh, qualified trainers available across, because sometimes uh, people have to move between different universities and so on to be able to support the new ones and the private ones and, and vice versa. And so the amount of time is a challenge. Secondly, training sites that are accredited become limited. And, Sometimes the number of students per site becomes a, a challenge in terms of whether they are getting adequate experiences whilst on various sort of attachments and so on. But I think it becomes then a challenge for the regulators who accredit uh, the, the training schools as to what is expected of, of uh, as part of the curriculum and what skills are expected of the products when they come out. And so that must be uh, uh, strictly monitored in order to retain accreditation and so on. And I've seen situations where some private schools have had challenges because they didn't quite meet some of these uh, uh, requirements. Over.
Thank you very much. Somebody has uh, commented about technology and uh, using the point of care ultrasound that uh, technology is actually improving on the engagement of students in the in the communities and i think that also was referred to when we talked about about uh, using the internet any comments on that well anything which makes um uh community health attractive to students like that point of care ultrasound diagnosis is welcome and the more of that uh, there is uh, the better uh, and it um, makes such huge revolutions in fact for me that was one of the biggest experiences working in a rural hospital uh, how many years ago is that that was uh, uh, my adventure to uh, Mora Hospital, doing being a general duty practitioner, having been an open heart surgeon, the uh, ultrasound was a revolution. Particularly, you know, a, a woman comes: is this uh, abortion complete or incomplete? For a long time, we were having problems deciding. But as soon as those ultrasound machines came that was immediate decision. So uh, I think we should encourage technology, which uh, makes community medicine uh, attractive to students and to practitioners. Hmm. I think, uh, if I may, uh, I think this uh, yes, is yes. A, a very important uh, point around how technology uh, enhances uh, both training and also the practice uh, uh, out there. And it brings me back to the question around um, uh, rural health or uh, other forms of community health in remote and uh, uh, deprived areas and how this becomes part of policy and, and strategies in ministries of health. And, and one of the greatest things that we need to consider nowadays is how technology can facilitate this. And this is incumbent on things like mobile penetration in these rural areas, rapidly increasing all over Africa, but still with quite significant pockets without access. And this is where uh, a certain level of intersectoral uh, coordination between sectors that might not, on the surface of it, look like uh, being complementary, but are critical to get some of these developments out there to uh, rural and remote areas. So, Thank you very much. We are almost coming to the end of our uh, webinar, but I would like to give each of our presenters a chance to summarize in maybe a minute or two. And we'll begin off with the Professor Maswa. Can you give us your last thoughts? Uh, uh, thank you. And thank you, Elsie, for a beautiful moderation. And all the participants for taking the trouble to prepare. Uh, for this uh, 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 discussion. My takeaway message is that um, uh, community health and preparing uh, our students to become champions for community health, to practice community health, uh, has got <clears throat> a push today in Africa with this meeting. And uh, um, reminded of that group who are in our free health already, can we find a way of uh, invigorating them uh, so that we start now as inspired by COVID as well, to bring back uh, community health and preparation and training for community health and funding for community health to become a priority in our countries. Uh, I would like this as a um, follow-up to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Maswa. We'll go on to Professor Cooper. Please give us your light thoughts. Thank you very much. And I agree that with the, what Professor Maswa has been saying, it has been a very stimulating discussion. 
I think for me, two things is that, um, you know, I learned many years ago, if, if, I, if I hear something, I will know, but if I experience it, I'll understand. And it's really, context is critical. If we don't go into the context, if we don't take people into the context, if we don't let them experience it, they will not understand it. You can't understand community, rural, those aspects by reading it in a book. Um, so we have to introduce students to that context to prepare them for that. The second thing is in terms of equity. Equity means that for the same outcomes, we need to give more to those who have less. Um, and unfortunately, the attitude often in policies and governments is if we just carry on sort of putting things at the top, it'll eventually get to the bottom. We've just got to let it, you know, run out. But I mean, always rural, the uh, remote, the underserved areas are always going to be uh, behind in that. We actually have to give specific attention to development to the underdeveloped communities if we really want to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Dovlo? Yes, yeah, so a couple of things. Again, I thank all the participants for the questions. Uh, one is uh, a point raised around how can we contribute to a framework that allows Ministry of Health to approach uh, health uh, service provision for uh, rural and underserved areas, not necessarily rural, some maybe urban, and how did, does that become part of policy? The second for me is about, um, in terms of community participation, how we expand the community's capacity to engage with the sector more effectively. Or sometimes I think our interventions are one-sided and may require the uh, engagement with another sector, but I think it's very important. Finally, it's about uh, uh, a repeat of the point raised by Professor Cooper around placing our trainees and our professionals within the community as part of their experiences uh, when uh, uh, they are in training placing them in a way that brings together the teams that are going to work together. And also, I would suggest that after qualification, that their continuing education involves uh, continued engagement with communities and that be provided as part of the incentives and motivation they need to move forward. Over. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our speakers, thank you very much for sharing with, with us those important thoughts on community engagement. I'd also like to thank all those that have participated. This is a very important topic, especially when we think about rural communities in Africa, because a, a very high percentage of our communities actually are rural, and there's a need for them to get services, and we must know how to engage with them. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. And I would like to point you to the technical working group in AfriHealth, which is uh, it's called the Community-Based Education and Service uh, Technical Working Group, but it's really interested in community engagement. So we'll send you an invite, all those that registered, so that you can get involved and we move this movement uh, forward. Thank you very much and have a nice afternoon or evening wherever you are. Thank you very much. AfriHealth, the African Platform for Human Resources for Health, um, Stellenbosch University and uh, Archist for organizing this uh, webinar. We, we've come to the end. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.